All right, so we're out in our sugar bush uh, looking at some of our tubing line setup that we have. Uh, so this is our, our main lines that are coming up out of our, uh, our sap house. So we've got, um, this is both a wet line and dry line system. So in a large operation, you typically need to have a separate vacuum line that gives you volume space for the air. Cause you usually, when you're using vacuum pumps, you need more volume within that tubing line to be able to pull all the air out of the system than what you do uh, for actually volume for the liquid, for the sap passing through. If you don't have enough volume for that air, it's gonna lower your vacuum cause there's not gonna be room to pass it out. Or if it gets restricted too much, it's gonna, there's gonna be a resistance against rubbing up the, against the sidewalls of your tubing that it's going to slow it down. We want to get it down to our sap house, to our vacuum pump as quick as possible, getting that, letting that air escape out of the system. So in here we have this bigger line is actually our dry line. This is pulling all the air out of the system. This is our, our wet line that um, is pulling sap down through. But then our main wet line that's going up through, we don't usually want to put our sap going, our laterals going right into that so we don't get vacuum leaks. Because our biggest vacuum leaks is coming usually from our laterals and our manifolds. So we have a separate wet line that this one here does connect down into our wet line lower down. Um, so this is our, our main line. This main line is being hung up by high tensile wire that's going, uh, being tied between trees, so it's nice and tight. We have wire ties that keeps that tight to that high tensile wire, so we don't have any dips that can cause freeze ups. That can be issues for getting sap when it starts flowing the next time when it thaws out. Uh, so we want to keep that line to be flowing at least two percent slope downhill, and we don't want any dips in it. Then we have our lateral lines coming out of our main lines. That's what attaches is gonna to run to our individual trees. Out of the, where that lateral attaches, we have what's called a manifold. And manifolds, it's important to get a good quality manifold that's not gonna have any vacuum leaks on you because that's where a lot of your leaks are. This loops around, we have, um, in this particular system, we have these straight connectors um, that have a little hook that attaches to that mainline wire. So I'm not pulling on the manifold that can cause a vacuum leak. When I pull on this lateral, it's pulling right from that wire. So that's hooking onto there. We have a lateral that's then going out and it's connecting like five trees here together. So the lateral goes out, there's a drop line that goes to each of our spouts um, that we have on each individual tree then. So when it comes to tapping a tree, that is really important. It seems basic, like you're just gonna go out there, drill a hole in the tree, put a spout in, but it's actually a little bit more thought that you need to put into it. It's a little more complicated than, you know, if we wanna get high quality production from our trees and we wanna think about the long-term health of our trees to be able to continue to tap those year after year, it's important to be careful in how you tap a tree. One of the first things you wanna do is you wanna assess the tree. Is it even healthy? Does it have a good canopy or is it living? Um, so important to look up and assess, you know, what is the canopy like? Is this a tree that it should even be tapping? Is it big enough? We want to make sure our trees are at least typically at least eight inches, if not larger in diameter. So that's we, so we have room to new wood to continue tapping around the tree because when we tap into a tree, trees have the ability to uh, compartmentalize is what they, we call it, um, but it's a wounding response. So when there's a damage on the tree, same things happens if you bump up against a tree in your front yard with your mower deck and your lawnmower, there's a wound that's gonna be created within the tree. So the tree's gonna build these walls and block off that area and create dead wood so that any pathogens that get into that wound don't get picked up by other sap that's flowing within the tree and get carried to other parts of the tree. Now, when we tap maple trees during the dormant season, they can't create that dead zone right away. But once, after we've tapped them and once we hit the growing season, they are gonna create that dead zone. So we can never tap into that exact same spot Again, we need to have new wood. So we need to slowly work around the tree so that there's always new wood to be tapping into. Um, and in doing that, uh, the tree is putting on growth rings and that those growth rings as the tree's growing wider, there's gonna be new wood that tap into. So we like to practice pattern tapping here um, when we're tapping into so that we don't avoid tapping into old trees. So other alternative is haphazard where you're just gonna go up to a tree find a spot and tap right into it. But we like to keep into a system so that we, we're keeping general pattern going around the tree so we don't, we avoid getting old tap wood. Because if we hit old tap wood, you're not gonna get much sap or maybe no sap at all. 
Uh, so when you're tapping the tree, when you're drilling in, you want to look at your shavings. You should have nice, creamy, kind of white shavings. If you're getting more tan shavings, then you're getting an old tap wood and you're either A, not going to get any sap at all. If it's all old tap wood that's dead, there's not going to be any sap flowing through that area. Or you're, you're just going to get a little tiny bit on the outside, but more than likely you won't get anything. Um, so when we get that tap zone, that dead tap zone, it's gonna be the width of the tap hole that we're drilling in, the width of our drill bit, and it's gonna be the depth, which we should be drilling an inch and a half to two inches into the tree. There's no reason to go more than two inches into the tree. Um, but that dead zone goes up and down from the tap hole at least eight to 10 inches, sometimes even more. So we can't go right above or below that old tap hole, so we need to shift over. So in our pattern tapping, we want to tap in one spot, and then the next year we're going to move over an inch or two. Um, in this case, we're going left, we're going to move over an inch or two left, and then we're going to go up or down at least eight to 10 inches. Um, and within our woods here, to help know where we tapped previous years, we put a little uh, spray paint of a tree marking paint right below the tap hole before we pull the spout at the end of the season. So last year we used green, a couple of years before that we used orange, I can see some old yellow. So you can see this was last year's uh, tap hole, this is where we have it this year. There was a lot more snow so we could reach that easier when that tap was put in. Um, green, this was the year before, orange, that was the year before. So I have this pattern of up and down and then we went way up here, but next year I'll shift over a little bit and be down in here. I also want to, if you don't paint, you just at least you want to be assessing, looking for these old tap holes. You can see these have closed up completely um, in previous years. Uh, you can see last year's is starting to close a little bit. Uh, it's slightly open, but it's still, it's closing. It's important to look at old tap holes too from previous years to see how healthy is that tree. It's a good indicator of your tree health and growth that if those tap holes are three years old or more and they haven't closed up, that's probably not a healthy tree. It's not growing quickly, but they should close up in a, a year or two. Um, so I'm looking at where, where's a good clean wood I can tap into, where are my old tap holes, I'm not hitting them, how well is the tree growing. And then when I'm going to drill, I'm gonna hold on to that drill tight so that I get a nice round hole going into the tree. You don't wanna let that drill slip around because if you get an oval tap hole when you go to put in that spout, it's not gonna create a good seal and the, that's gonna be a vacuum leak potential within your, your tubing operation. So you wanna make sure that you have a, a good sealed tight tap hole that's nice and round, straight in, straight out, that's gonna let all those shavings come out of the tree and then gently tap uh, your, bit, your, your spout into that tap hole till you hear a little hollow thud. You don't wanna drive it all the way to the back wall of the tap hole. So this is a wet and dry conductive uh, maple lines where we have our dry line that's pulling the vacuum out of, uh, or is under vacuum pulling the air out of the system. And then our, our wet line that's pulling all the sap through. And so when we get to a point where we're gonna spur off, cause we usually don't have our lateral lines going right into this wet lines, we'll have a spur. And so you can kind of see in the background, here's this wet line that branches off. And off of here, we've got several laterals that are feeding into that individual, uh, the spur line main line that we have, this one inch main line. Um, but notice this large um, loop here, this is what we call a jumper. So this, this spur line is feeding directly into this main line right below this tree. So that sap's coming in. And the sap line here, this main line is under vacuum, but there's not lots of room for pulling air out of it. So we need to get good vacuum to the spur line. So we have this jumper that's coming from our our vacuum, our dry line here, that's pulling all the air out of the spur into here. But just in case that um, it goes up, because we don't want the sap to be traveling up into here, the sap's gonna stay low and go into our, our wet line, main line, and the, the air will come up into our dry line then. If perchance that wet line were to fro freeze up down slope from there, the sap starts to build up, you will get sap that will sometimes come up into these, that's okay. Um, it doesn't hurt, but typically when everything's sawed out and flowing, and flowing heavy and we want good vacuum, this is gonna keep us high vacuum throughout our system. So around our sugar bush, that's a really important process to think about that, you know, it's nice to look at our sugar house and all the equipment we have, but it's really what's happening out in our woods. That's where our sugars are being produced. And what's happening over the summertime during our growing season through photosynthesis in the leaves, producing sugars, 
That's the important part of our trees. So thinking about the health of our trees, how they're doing the growing season, and how the future of our forest looking is gonna be really, really important within your maple operations. So we're in a section of our sugar bush here um, that actually had a thinning trial done. So thinning where they came in and they removed trees. It's an important process. It's, it's hard as sugar makers. Sometimes we wanna think about more trees, the better that's more trees to tap. But if those trees aren't healthy, um, then they're not gonna be yielding much for you. Also, if there's really heavy competition, they're competing with each other, they're not gonna be healthy. So sometimes you wanna come in and thin out trees that either aren't healthy, that aren't doing well, and open up and allow sunlight because it's that sunlight that's, again, creating those sugars through photosynthesis during the growing season. The bigger your canopy, the higher sugars that you're typically gonna have within um, your sap a lot of times because when there's bigger canopies, there's more leaves, more sites for more of what I like to call little factories for producing sugars. So you're gonna have sweeter sap trees typically. So in a forest, you know, a lot of times our canopies can be pushed to little tiny canopies at the top. But if you open them up, you can get some more depth to your canopies, more branches. Um, they can spread out a little bit more, get some more light. The trees are not competing with each other. You can get bigger canopies. Um, with more leaves on it. If you've got a tree in your front lawn that's got big branches reaching all the way down to the ground, you can get higher sugars. You can get three, four percent a lot of times in those trees versus two percent out in your forest maybe because it's more areas for producing sugar. So here we've thinned those trees out, um, removed some low quality trees uh, so that these canopies can expand. But with that, we've got some open gaps from more than what we need in a typical forest. We'd want to have more trees filling this in. So we want to think about the future of our forest. So we're trying to create regeneration within our forest. And a lot of issues with regeneration of maples within forests um, has to do with deer browsing. That deer love to feed on little maple saplings and seedlings in our forest. They come through and they'll just nip the top of the bud and they'll eat that bud. They love eating buds, especially in the dormant season. There's not much else to feed on. They're feeding on little buds off of little trees and seedlings. So if they come and they nip the buds, it's gonna maybe not kill the tree right away, but it's gonna suppress that tree and it's gonna be a lot of times outcompeted by other vegetation. So um, we are, here we have actually some little trials that we actually have a mesh fence here to be a deer um, secluding them out of our areas where we thin, we open up the canopy. So there's lots of light here on the forest floor so that we can get new vegetation to regenerate um, besides just our maples. And so we're trying to keep the deer out of here. So this is an experiment that Dr. Peter Smolich from Cornell University has, has set up in here to try to keep deer out to improve the vegetation. So we have two different systems. We have this uh, five foot mesh uh, fence and we also have a higher uh, high tensile a six strand wire. Um, there's issues with both of them um, and we're always looking at costs. The mesh system actually is a little bit better for keeping the deer out. Uh, if it's a small enough area, they can certainly hop over this. Um, and if it's a small enough area, they usually don't want to go into it. Where the high tensile wire, it's taller, but they can uh, skip between uh, the actual wires. They'll crawl between it. So there are still some issues with that and things we continue to research to try to prevent deer from getting in and browsing in those different areas. So having access through your sugar bush is really important so you can get out there and do work a lot quicker if you need to cut lines off. So here uh, we couldn't bring the lines up over this road that crosses here so instead we put in culverts that sends the line underneath the road. We have a foam insulation wrap around that tubing just to protect it so that if it brushes up against that culvert pipe the ground being colder it doesn't uh, make that sap line too cold where it frees up in there. So allows that sap to flow through, gives us good access. We have a few different culverts out through this road, so we have access all the way throughout, throughout the maple season. We don't have to connect or disconnect lines. 